Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the United States, it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's ARIA Formula meeting on the humanitarian crisis in Cameroon. We are joined by a distinguished panel of speakers, and I will introduce them individually in a moment, who will inform us about the scope of the crisis and make recommendations on how to address it. I would like to thank our co-host, the Dominican Republic, Germany, and the United Kingdom for their support in organizing today's gathering. And we would like to warmly welcome participating member states and members of civil society who are joining us in this room and via webcast all over the world. Today's meeting is an opportunity to better understand Cameroon's humanitarian crisis, the challenges and the dangers of helping populations in need, and the threats to respect for international humanitarian law. Our desired outcomes for this meeting are an increased awareness and visibility of the deteriorating humanitarian situation in Cameroon, plus the immediate opening of humanitarian space and the provision of unhindered access for humanitarian personnel by parties to the conflict. Since 2018, the United States government has contributed more than $87 million in Cameroon to provide humanitarian assistance to host communities, IDPs, and refugees. This aid is critical for saving lives, but it can only be effective when we have access to vulnerable populations. To better understand the scale of the crisis, I am delighted to be joined by leaders in the field with firsthand knowledge of the situation on the ground. <laughs> Under Secretary General Mark Lowcock needs no introduction regarding his role in overseeing UN humanitarian assistance. We are grateful that you are here. We also welcome two expert practitioners who made the trip to New York to speak to us regarding their personal experiences providing humanitarian assistance in Cameroon. Esther Omam Njomo is the Executive Director of Reach Out Cameroon. Welcome Esther to the UN, and thank you for taking the trip from the southwest region of Cameroon. Father Paul Fru Njoki Kong serves as the Director of Caritas for the Archdiocese of Bamenda in the northwest region of Cameroon. Thank you for joining us in New York. Finally, noted humanitarian Jan Egland, the current Secretary General of the Norwegian Refugee Council and former UN Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs, joins us by video conference from Oslo. Jan, we look forward to hearing more about what you saw and heard during your recent trip to Cameroon. But first things first, Under Secretary Lowcock, I invite you to set the stage for our conversation. The floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, and I'm pleased to have the opportunity to join this afternoon's discussion on this important but underreported crisis. Cameroon, which is one of the largest economies in Africa, is currently facing worsening violence and conflict. Today, 4.3 million people need humanitarian assistance across the country. That is 30% more than last year, and it means that one Cameroonian in six needs humanitarian assistance or protection. And most of those people needing help, more than half of them are children. Eight regions out of the country's 10 regions are affected by one of three concurrent, simultaneous humanitarian crises in Cameroon at the moment. Firstly, in its east and north regions, Cameroon is hosting more than 270,000 refugees from the Central African Republic, putting a significant burden on host communities who are already very poor and live in very fragile and vulnerable conditions. Second, Cameroon's far north remains affected by the Lake Chad Basin crisis, that, as you know, is one of the world's most severe humanitarian crises. 1.9 million people or so living in Cameroon's far north, that's half the population of that part of the country, need urgent assistance, and that includes 100,000 refugees or more from Nigeria. I do, on this note, want particularly to thank and recognize the government of Cameroon and the people of Cameroon, especially in that part of the country, for their generosity in hosting 
refugees from neighbouring countries. Thirdly, the humanitarian situation in the northwest and southwest regions has rapidly deteriorated, and that is what I want to talk most about in my presentation to you today. The crisis in the northwest and southwest regions started with peaceful protests in the English-speaking regions, but has now turned violent. It was one of the fastest growing displacement crises in Africa last year. For the past three years, the population has been subjected to ongoing violence and attacks by armed actors. The level of the crisis today is more alarming than ever. Both the humanitarian and the security situation continue to deteriorate and run the risk of spiraling out of control, including in neighboring departments, namely the littoral and west. In 2018, last year, 160,000 people were estimated to need humanitarian assistance in the northwest and southwest regions. Today, there are not 160,000, but more than 1.3 million people, at least eight times as many in need, and that amounts to a third of the local population. Half a million people are internally displaced some of those internally displaced people stay with host communities in the main towns in the western part of the country, or in Yaoundi, or in the country's largest uh, city, Douala. Most of them, though, are still hiding in the forests in fear of violence. Thousands of homes and entire villages have been destroyed across the two regions, and that poses significant challenges to the goal of return for people who fled. The fear of attacks further prevents people um, from being able to return and also um, prevents access to previous um, livelihoods, especially farming and, and other livelihood opportunities in their home areas. That means those people are essentially increasingly and in some cases totally reliant on humanitarian assistance. Ordinary people are the direct targets of violence. Children are caught in crossfire. They're subject to arbitrary arrest and detention. The northwest and southwest regions used previously to be the places where education was best across the country. But a ban on education imported uh, by armed actors has undermined that. In the past three years, at least 70 70 schools have been destroyed, pupils have been kidnapped, teachers have been kidnapped. Today, more than 80% of schools are closed, and more than 600,000 children are deprived of an education in both regions. Attacks on medical staff and infrastructure have also increased. There have been at least 70 such incidents noted since last year. They include the abductions of medical staff, they also include the burning of at least three hospitals. In both regions, some 40% of health facilities are simply not operational. Sexual violence and abuse are also increasingly documented. There are reports of girls as young as 13 living in the forest, pregnant and scared to move. In response to this grim reality, and despite the challenges, UN agencies and NGOs have scaled up the delivery of humanitarian assistance and protection. There are more than 40 humanitarian organizations uh, operational today. They're mostly local NGOs. They've between them reached more than 100,000 people so far this year. 42,000 of the most vulnerable people received emergency livelihood program or dry food delivery in March, but only 30,000 were reached with that kind of assistance in April. And that is a reflection of the access challenges and the impact of the continuing violence. While the environment is complex, there's no question that we need a more ambitious and comprehensive response. We're trying to target 820,000 people for assistance in the region this year. Insecurity, violence, uh, what are called weekly ghost town days where businesses and shops are closed 
and civilians are forced to stay at home, and frequent lockdowns, uh, all of those things limit the days on which humanitarian operations are possible. We do have access. It's limited and unpredictable. And we continue to work with all actors to continue to improve it. We're also increasing our engagement with communities to build acceptance and negotiate access with all the parties. And on this point, we work through existing structures, including faith-based groups and national NGOs, who are often best placed to support access for the humanitarian agencies. Humanitarians themselves are at risk. At least a dozen national staff of humanitarian organizations have been abducted since last year. Thankfully, so far, they've all been released. National NGOs are especially vulnerable to these risks. And we need more experienced humanitarian staff in a, to in order us to navigate these difficulties and complexities more effectively. The biggest challenge, notwithstanding everything I've said so far, relates to the insufficiency of funding. In 2018, the UN's Cameroon Humanitarian Response Plan was actually one of the smallest in terms of the resources we were seeking to respond to needs. Despite that, despite being a small plan, it was also one of the least well-funded globally. This year, the United Nations and NGOs are looking for some $300 million to reach 2.3 million people, including a third of them in the northwest and southwest regions. And of that $300 million, we've so far received only $38 million, less than 13% of what we require. Half of that money was received for the Northwest and Southwest crises, and most of that, most of that $19 million, was in fact um, allocated by me through the Central Emergency Response Fund. I do want to thank all of the donors who provided funds to the SURF last year. As you know, we had a record-breaking year of financing for the SURF, and it was only because of that that we were able to make this um, allocation for those parts of Cameroon. There are four critical sectors, education, health, water and, uh, water and sanitation and hygiene, and nutrition, for which we've received barely any funding this year, such as the overall situation on lack of funding. As you'll all understand, humanitarian organizations can't sustain a response unless they're funded. They're essentially out of their own um, forms of resources. Indeed, several um, key frontline humanitarian agencies, especially international NGOs, are going to be forced to withdraw from the region if additional funding doesn't reach them soon. It's in no one's interest, I think, to see the humanitarian situation spiral out of control. So I ask today for the help of the international community in three areas. First and foremost, to increase awareness of the humanitarian problem in Cameroon. And this afternoon's meeting is an important way of doing that, but we need to build on it. We have to persuade everybody to come together to address the underlying causes of the current crisis, including and especially the need for peaceful resolution of conflict and the need for more progress with sustainable development. Secondly, I ask for your support and that of others to improve the financing we have for the humanitarian operation so that we can reach a larger proportion of those people in need. And thirdly, I ask for your help and assistance in persuading and causing all parties to respect international law and to provide safe, timely, and unimpeded humanitarian access. Anybody with influence over the parties should please exercise that influence. And we'll also need to urgently strengthen awareness and respect for humanitarian principles, including the protection of education and medical facilities. I've described to you the attacks on those facilities, which, as you know, um, those attacks are violations, and we need better compliance 
with the key elements of international law. This situation is quite urgent and I therefore rely on your support to enable us to tackle it better. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much, Under Secretary General Lowcock, for those sobering facts and calls for action and what we can do to help. Esther, your organization has been uh, responding to the needs identified at the community levels. We welcome your statement about what you are seeing on the ground. Esther. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, members of the Security Council for inviting me today to this important meeting on Cameroon. I am Jomo Esther Umam, the Executive Director of Reach Out, a locally based organization, civil society organization, whose headquarters is in the, in the southwest region of Cameroon. Equally, I am the general coordinator for the Southwest and Northwest Women's Tax Force. It pleases me to sit before you this day, not only as the executive director of Reach Out, nor the general coordinator of the Southwest and Northwest Women's Tax Force, but as a woman, a mother, a wife, a daughter, and a sister, who would like to give a human face to the ongoing crisis in the two regions today. I am yet to talk on behalf of those women mothers, wives, sisters, and daughters who have lost it all to this crisis. Those who are trapped in the bushes, in the forest, because they lost everything which they could hold on to. I am here today thinking about those women who are living in uncompleted buildings in other regions other than where they were living. I'm here, I am here today talking on behalf of those women who are today called refugees or dis internally displaced, who live in host communities, those who live in motor parks, those who live in petrol stations, those whose, whose children are not going to school, those girls and women who are sexually abused, and the boys who have adopted negative coping attitudes. I am equally here today to talk on behalf of the Southwest and Northwest Women's Tax Force, whose aim is to significantly contribute in ending this crisis. I am here for those women who for the past one year have been carrying this symbol of orange, which stands for non-violence, meaning that women, mothers, wives, sisters, and daughters, we are for non-violence. I'll be talking about the humanitarian issues in the ongoing conflict and make a call to action. I will say that I'm giving a human face to the crisis in the Northwest and Southwest regions, which has greatly affected both regions for the past three years. Our communities swept up in conflicts have left hundreds of deaths, suffering masses, and over one million in need of saving, life-saving assistance. The situation is becoming increasingly desperate. With no one spared from the violence and trauma, which is spiraling out of control. The violence has uprooted over half a million people from their homes and forced over 40,000 people to seek refuge in neighboring Nigeria. Displacement, which is already very high, continues to have serious consequences on the livelihoods and living conditions 
of the affected populations. Many of the conflict affected people, especially women, are growing more vulnerable as the violence persists. A violence which has been present in both regions for the past three years and humanitarian assistance remains inadequate and still far from covering all humanitarian needs. The vulnerability has been further compounded by the lack of access to farmlands and markets, the deterioration in medical and water facilities, the lack of shelter and civil status documents, many health care services as well as health structures and medical staff have come under attack. In most areas within the conflict zones, health facilities are non-functional or have been burnt with medical staff who have fled fearing for their lives. Education has also been significantly impacted with very limited access. Presently, less than 15 to 20 percent of children go to school. The majority of the displaced are women and children who ironically are the base of the society who need protection at all times. It is estimated that over 3,000 children are suffering from severe acute malnutrition and require urgent treatment. Regret regrettably, more than 40% of clinics and health centers no longer provide vaccination, antenatal clinics, antiretroviral treatments, and less than 15% of beds are assisted by skilled attendants. In this regard, we wish to say that the violent situation prevailing in the Northwest and Southwest regions is now an incubator of human rights violation and abuses, a source of pain and misery. We have a woman who just died three days ago before I could uh, embark on my journey to this place, a pregnant woman who got into labor and the labor got complicated. And the population, the neighbors were afraid to take her to the nearby health center because that is a day nobody was supposed to go out. The neighbors called for civil society organizations were involved into humanitarian assistance. They tried all their best to secure access to no avail. They looked for motorbikes to transport the lady and these refused for fear of being shot till late in the night. And in the early hours of the next day, this woman died with the baby in her womb. Our children suffer or die every day. And we cannot sit and be indifferent amid such chaos without talking and more importantly, without acting. Why will you ask me, a mother, a woman, a wife, a daughter, a sister, not to talk about what I see every day going on in our communities? What, why won't I talk about what is happening to our children, to ourselves? Most of our children, in order to cope in these deteriorating conditions, have tried to survive and are now using negative coping mechanisms, such as stealing, juvenile delinquency, prostitution, or becoming drug addicts. STIs, HIV and AIDS are on the rise among the youth population as a result of rape and early forced marriages. The rate of teenage pregnancies, early motherhood, and trafficking in persons have increased due to the hardship people experience. It is paramount on all stakeholders to establish respect, dignity, and prosperity for our children and the next generations. Access to these displaced persons for any sort of humanitarian intervention can vary depending on whom the specific actors are. If today you are not known in the communities, the community becomes suspicious and it is difficult for you to get into that community to provide whatsoever support or aid you have for them. Women, especially civil society leaders, for example, have ways of making inroads 
into these conflict-raising communities. This is because the women are mothers, wives, sisters, and givers of life, and they do care about children's welfare. For this reason, we are calling on all international organizations, the UN and others who are concerned with humanitarian response to work closely with national organizations that have access and acceptance from the communities. This is because there is a mutual understanding and trust among the communities and the national organizations. When it comes for, to reach out, for example, we had previously covered all the six divisions of the Southwest region for other programs before this crisis. And SNOT, which stands for Southwest and Northwest Women's Task Force, has a representation in all 13 divisions that make up the Northwest and Southwest region. This access is possible because most of our women-led organizations are spread within 13 divisions. In as much as this is done, national organizations and civil society need technical support, guidance and capacity building from the international humanitarian community to make sure that the response is more effective, timely, and, acceptable, and of acceptable quality following humanitarian principles. Investment in local capacity will also help to ensure sustainability of the response and greater accountability toward affected communities. While international humanitarian presence was strengthened last year, and despite our combined efforts, we believe that only a few, less than 10% rich at source of the affected population has received assistance so far because the resources are limited and access to some areas remain problematic. Given the fact that many dialogue alternatives we no concrete follow-up have been initiated locally and each party still maintains their position, there is an urgent need for both parties to come together and start talking. If not, the possibility of an immediate end of hostility will still be elusive. This will imply continued violence and hostility within the communities and thereby continued massive population displacement and humanitarian needs. Thus, we suggest the following. First, three years after the beginning of the crisis, the UN and its partners should urgently step up humanitarian aid because what is given is far below expectation than what is required. Meanwhile, we do not know why very little attention is paid to this crisis in the Northwest and Southwest when it comes to humanitarian aid. We therefore call on all humanitarian actors to step up the engagement in humanitarian efforts. Secondly, reach out and snort think that there should be more effective presence and regular field visits, not just in Boya and Bamenda, the capital cities of the two uh, regions, but in the deep field where the needs are there is. By so doing, they will have more accurate data from the victims or those affected from within the communities about their conditions and needs. This will enable a more tailored assistance and greater accountability to the affected population. Thirdly, we encourage stronger partnership between international humanitarian partners and national organizations to expand humanitarian access and go a step further in the localization of humanitarian assistance. Fourthly, the UN and other international actors can encourage and offer different services to protect and address humanitarian needs. They can offer, for example, home shelter programs by putting in place temporary homes for the victims and affected populations. They can also institute legal counseling and referral systems and have a field presence to step up confidence among the population. 
finally, and beyond humanitarian programming. The UN could support greater efforts to encourage talks and dialogue between the conflicting parties who are brothers for an eventual end to the crisis for them to come up with a roadmap to achieving sustainable peace that builds more on our existing strength and influence. I earlier said that I had been a victim three times. Two times I was attacked in my home at gunpoint. The first time I was thrown on the floor and a knock hit my head, which caused me getting low cuts since then because I developed health issues. Still, I kept my morale high because I had many who were looking on to me for provision of care and support. The second time, in my own very house, all of my family was held hostage for three hours, for I don't know why. And my grandchild, my grandson, the first grandson, was being taken away from me when I was giving him medication because he was very sick after his first anniversary. And he was being tossed up and down like a ball and threatened to be taken away from me when the mother was not even in the region. And I asked the people in front of me, my son, what did I do wrong that I should get this from you? I died that day, I died that day as a mother, as a grandmother. But I resurrected with the determination to forge ahead in my activism to see that I carry on the crusade for peace because I could put myself in the shoes of all those women and girls who have gone through the pains and suffering which I just witnessed in a very short period of time. The third time, my two children on the 20th of April were kidnapped. And again, I kept cool the first day, the second day. I put on the face of a CEO and a general coordinator. In the night of the second day, I could not bear it anymore. The mother in me resurrected and I passed out. Thanks to an adopted doctor of mine, I was brought back to life. And I'm here today to speak on behalf of all those women who have gone through these audience through the pains and sufferings. And I'm here today to talk about that little girl who is called Mariana, whose mother and siblings were shot. And the father had to flee, had to run into the bushes, into the forest. And she was left alone in the care of her paternal aunt. And because the paternal aunt had a son who is dropped out from school because schools are not going on, and this child was not also going to school, a 12 years old girl, she was sexually abused by this boy and got pregnant. And when the aunt discovered this, she was thrown away from that house, sent to the unknown. And our members got this information and brought the report to us and we as mothers, as women, were heartbroken and started looking for this girl. What about Mama Joanna, who told us in one of our distribution sites, where we are distributing food in collaboration, in partnership with WFP, who told us that she had to trek for two to three hours in order to get to us for food? that she passed so many corpses. As she was coming in the forest path, and other women saw and got frightened and went back. What about Mr. John, who left one of the villages and had to trek 20 kilometers in order to get to one of the distribution sites? 
What about all these people who are going through pain and suffering? I think, we think that it is time for us to start silencing the guns. We think that it is time for us to start talking. Let us begin to talk. Let us start talking genuinely. Let us start having inclusive dialogue. Let us sit face to face, facing each other, discussing the issues and identifying common grounds and looking for the way forward. That way forward, that will lead us to sustainable, peaceful solutions. We want to regain the peace which we formerly enjoyed before this crisis. Thank you for your kind attention. Esther, thank you very much for your personal and passionate account and the serious impact on women and children in the overall country. Father, I now invite you to share your experiences with the council. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President, and all protocol duly respected for giving me this unique opportunity to address this August Assembly I am most honored and humbled, but delighted to share with you on the deteriorating humanitarian situation in the Anglophone regions of Cameroon. I am a priest and a pastor, and at the same time, the director of Caritas Bamenda. I would have preferred to be back home providing the badly needed humanitarian assistance to my affected, hungry, starving, stressed, and traumatized people. I am not a politician, but I'm here because of the lives of about four million people who are affected by this crisis within the context of the ongoing sociopolitical crisis ever since it degenerated into an armed conflict in 2017 till day, things are only getting worse. The escalation began in the Anglophone regions in September 2017 when Cameroon security forces used live ammunition on peaceful protesters in protest marches. There have recently been disappearances, and even up to a few days ago, when I flew from Cameroon, corpses have been found in various places in Bamenda. Within the last 10 months, several thousands of civilians have been killed. The disappearance and death of young males is no longer news. And some of, those who have been, some of those who have been killed are persons with disability or special needs or the age who cannot run away to safety. For want of time and sparing this noble house, the embarrassment of the sudden situation we live in the Anglophone regions I have left out the details of the recorded murders perpetrated either by the armed separatist groups, otherwise known as the Amber Boys, or the Cameroonian military, which acts as an instrument of terror to the local people. Corpses continue to be discovered here and there. It is how to know the number of security forces or pro-independent fighters that might have been killed. What is certain is the fact that is on an increase. Madam President, many buildings, including living homes, business centers, hospitals, private and public property, have been burned down in various localities in the English-speaking regions within the last 24 months. The belligerent parties have not claimed or accepted responsibility for these burnings. Yet, the figures are quite alarming. 
it is as indicated in these few statistics. In Bui Division alone, more than 1,500 houses have been raised down by flames, and the figures are on the increase. In Menchum Division, over 1,350 homes have been burnt down. In Momo Division, 2,000 plus homes and businesses raised to ashes. In Boyo, over 400 houses and at least six hospitals have been affected partly or completely by fires. The recent case being that of the district hospital of Kumba. These figures are not exhaustive, Madam President, and I am afraid they are on the rise. And it is logical, for the more homes are burned, the more people are displaced, the greater the humanitarian need. These needs are as of now underfunded as of the 4 million people affected, below 10% receive humanitarian assistance from the international humanitarian organizations. Few international actors are on the field. IRC is in the Southwest region, providing paper vouchers for IDPs. CRS is in, in collaboration with Caritas Bamenda is in the Northwest region providing e-vouchers for IDPs. Plan International and the Norwegian Missionary Society are worth mentioning here for their relentless effort. There are several others for want of time I didn't mention. I do understand that access is a problem for the international NGOs why they are dragging their feet. But the local partners do have a way to navigate to the targeted population, though not all the time. Madam President, as for access, the pro-independent fighters have made the region ungovernable. They have kept the roads impassable and grounded economic activities and the education sector, as well as the social life across the English regions, are also stagnant. There has been repeated reports of abductions by the same or other armed groups, and in some cases, a reports of torture and demands for ransom. These abductions include 11 male students who were abducted on the 31st of Wednesday, the 31st of October, 2018. And a few days later, on the 4th of November, the same year, 2018, 78 students and three staff members of the same institution, the Presbyterian Secondary School in Kwen, were equally abducted. The disquieting saga of St. Augustine's College in which 176 members of the Catholic institution were adopted on the 16th of February, 2018. Of this number, 170 students were generally below the age of 18. Three of our priests who tried to follow the trail of the abductees were also caught and detained by the same group, and all were only released a day later. These incidents forced the institutions to close down, including a minor seminary and other schools in the locality. The enrollment in our Catholic schools for the last academic years has dropped to less than 20% as the crisis escalated. This indicates an estimate of the number of children who are likely out of school now, except those who have moved and are enrolled in other regions. In the nursery and primary schools, it stands at 55,000. In the secondary and high schools, it stands at 25,000 in these two English-speaking regions. 
Madam President, the health sector has been greatly affected. The St. Martin de Porres Catholic Mission Hospital in Ginicom, the Bingo Baptist Hospital in Boyu Division are greatly touched. Also, the St. Elizabeth General Hospital and Cardiac Center, the only cardiac center in West and Central of Africa, as well as the Baptist, Banso Baptist Hospital, are not left out in this malaise. And a few others have been hit. Several people are said to have died at home who might have survived if they had access to health facilities. It is hard to imagine how many lives are being lost for the simple reason that patients are not able to move freely. The hospitals have had a tough time getting medications and or other hospital provisions. Patients that are referred to this from these hospitals or to these hospitals often get stuck due to blockages and crossfires. Those from around the area who might manage to find motorbikes to transport them pay huge sums of money to get to the health facilities. They end up not, move, not having money to pay for their medication. Health workers have been victims of this crisis. Three nurses have already been shot dead on their way to or from work dressed in uniforms. Several have been attacked and wounded even in the hospitals where they render service to the nation. The military have got into health facilities with firearms supposedly searching for anyone suspected to, suspected to be an, a pro-independence fighter undergoing treatment. The World Health Organization, Doctors Without Borders, Medicine du Monde, and others have been of invaluable help to the population in providing free health assistance. Madam President, a military solution has never been an option in any conflict resolution in the world. Dialogue is the solution. But who are those going to sit on the table? It's a question. I strongly appeal for the UN to get the protagonists to immediately stop the bloodshed and the killing of innocent civilians and call for a ceasefire. There is an urgent need of a neutral body to mediate and facilitate the dialogue in order to put an end to this humanitarian disaster. I appeal for the UN to equally scale up humanitarian assistance and force the Cameroonian government to demilitarize the Anglophone regions because with a military presence, the future is bleak and the end to the crisis is far from being a reality. In addition to the activities of the government forces and the pro-independent fighters, there is a possibility that a few individuals might be using the situation to make money for themselves. This is the economy of war, which you are well, much aware of. Because of these, the killings, the looting, the burning, the rape, the random gun battles, shortage of food and other provisions, abductions, torture, growing hate, lack of trust, suspicion, and difficulty in burying the dead and even giving them a dignified burial, and soot and many threats. Thousands of persons have been displaced within the two regions, and many others have fled to other places of the regions for safety. I received the very first set of displaced persons there were 25 in number. They had been attacked, their homes burned, and a lady among them, her husband was shot point blank in front of her, and a military person used his own motorbike and poured gasoline on him 
unleashed fire and had this man burned right in front of the wife. The wife was badly beaten with the machet, her hands wounded with the cutlass. She was beaten from the buttocks with a little baby of two years and another one that we're still holding, which was five years old. These came to my office. When they shared their experience, I wept at what was going on. Miss Madam President, according to the w to OCHA highlights on the side rep, four million people are affected in this. And in this number, 1.4 million are in need. 300 820,000 people are targeted. 530 are internally displaced persons. 376 are people in need of host communities. And of this number, 330,000 are people in great need. Therefore, as I mentioned, the UN and other international organizations should scale up the humanitarian activities in Cameroon to meet up with the high demands. Madam President, the people of the English-speaking regions in Cameroon are primarily agrarian, with houses burned and seats lost. And adding to that, the farming season of 2018 was irregular due to the crisis. And so has been this season which just began. And only an estimate of 20% of the population have planted in that area, and which is an area which largely depends on agriculture. Food insecurity, therefore, malnutrition, and associated health challenges are imminent in the near future. I insist, Madam President, that the UN has to scale up its humanitarian operations in these regions, or more lives will be lost. Madam President, our people of these two English regions are suffering a lot. I bear witness to this. I meet them on a daily basis. We are in pain. We are traumatized. We are sandwiched between the Amber Boys and the government security forces. Fear is the order of the day. One cannot talk freely. I speak out the truth because it's a noble thing to do. It is doing a service to my country, even if I'm, it means I will be hated and killed. It is, better for die, it is better to die with dignity for having told the truth than to live with shame for covering up. Many people live in a state of perpetual uncertainty and fear, not knowing what awaits them. Madam President, the UN can and should take actions to end this senseless, this senseless bloodshed. This is an urgency to make, there is an urgency to make a roadmap and engage both parties. Look at the root causes and drop the cosmetic solutions. Thank you for your kind attention and God bless you all. Thank you, Father, for your serious account as well and the impact, especially on schools and hospitals due to the humanitarian crisis. Jan, I hope you have been able to hear the conversation so far. And following your trip to Cameroon, what would you like the UN Security Council to know about what you saw? Over to you, please. Thank you very much, uh, Madam President. I would like to thank the Security Council for this opportunity to speak about the massive humanitarian suffering I witnessed when I visited Cameroon three weeks ago. Uh, but let me start by commending and endorsing the strong statements from our two Cameroonian colleagues and uh, from Mark Loka. So I traveled to uh, the southwest province of Cameroon and to the far north. In the former, I met with the communities fleeing armed conflict. In the latter, I spoke with refugees and internally displaced families fleeing Boko Haram violence. Cameroon has uh, for many years been a generous group itself to refugees, including from the Central African Republic and from Nigeria. We do appreciate the cooperation of the authorities in providing sanctuary to people in great need. 
Madam President, when brutal fighting displaces hundreds of thousands of civilians, it usually sets international alarm bells ringing. But the shocking unmet needs of tens of thousands of people fleeing violence in Southwest and Northwest Cameroon has so far resulted in no systematic mediation effort, no large relief program, little international media interest, and too little pressure on the parties to stop attacking civilians. So the collective silence surrounding the atrocities is as shocking as the untold stories are heartbreaking, and we heard several here today. And that is why this session is so important, and I congratulate the conveners for having put it up. A group of displaced and disillusioned women I met told me that they felt abandoned by the international community. As much as they fear the conflicting parties. And they asked me, where is the international solidarity? Where are the African organizations? Where are the donor nations? Where is Europe? This conflict has, after all, some of its roots in generations of interference on European colonial powers. I also met with families from hundreds of villages that have been burned. They affirmed that tens of thousands of people are still hiding in the bushes that, and that new attacks are taking place every single week. Children have been denied the right, right to education for years because of the political conflicts between grown adults. Most schools have been closed for years, and the Minister of Education affirms that at least 780,000 children are out of school. So we risk losing a generation to illiteracy. I was also, like my, my colleagues who just spoke, shocked by the scale and brutality of the blunt violence against civilians. Even hospitals have been attacked and health workers fear for their lives. The absence of a humanitarian response commensurate to the hundreds of thousands of people in great need and with unmet needs is striking. We are two few humanitarian actors on the ground and we are gravely unfunded. My colleagues in the Norwegian Refugee Council and the other relief organizations on the ground tell me they can reach many more people in need in the conflict ravaged areas in the southwest and northwest, despite the insecurity. And the parties to the conflict now also tell us they are ready to support access to all areas of great need. This includes the Southwest governor, whom I spoke to in Guaya, and it includes the armed opposition groups with whom we are in contact. And now our immediate priority must be access and assistance to the people hiding in the bushes who are, as of today, receiving no assistance nor protection. They fear they cannot return to their villages, nor do they feel that it is safe for them to go to the urban centers. These families are terrorized beyond belief. Similarly, in the far north of Cameroon, civilians feel abandoned. The humanitarian response there is also severely underfunded and now also underreported. The displaced children I met in the capital town, Marua, 
and surrounding areas had hoped one day to return to their ancestral land from where they fled Boko Haram violence. But they cannot return. The insecurity still plagues these areas. So the only thing that has changed for these communities is that their suffering and the violence raged against them has disappeared from our TV screens, from our hearts, and from our minds. In my 40 years as a humanitarian worker, I have too often seen how the lack of early intervention results in smaller conflicts becoming horrific and endless wars. There is still time to avoid the conflict in the southwest and northwest from escalating even further with untold suffering as a consequence. Equally, there is time to get hope and durable solutions to displaced families in the far north and to the Central African refugees or the Nigerian refugees like Cameroon hosts. Okay, so, Madam President, UN Security Council members, uh, our conclusion seen from the realities on the ground where I consulted with my colleagues are the following. First, the UN, the Secretariat, the Security Council, and all of the agencies and programs of this great family of organizations need to do better in what we have all pledged, namely to act to ensure conflict prevention, conflict resolution, and bridge building in communities before it is too late. The crisis in the English-speaking part of Cameroon is, without any doubt, one of the world's most neglected at the moment. The lack of information and international political tension has not prevented has has uh, not prevented the situation to deteriorate from peaceful demonstrations to the current atrocities committed by both sides. We need more independent information and reporting on the crisis. And more than anything, we need more action to protect and assist defenseless civilians. So we urgently need national and international conflict resolution resources to help stop the violence and start talks about the many grievances that do exist. Mediation or facilitation of peace talks should be done by local, national, and international actors who have the trust of both the government and the non-state armed groups. Second, Organizations and countries with influence in the conflict parties must make it clear that the attack on civilians, on their homes, on schools, on, on hospitals, on villages, are crimes under international law and cannot be allowed to continue. This deep and acute protection crisis should be alleviated by a greater presence by international organizations. And the UN humanitarian country team should be given the financial and uh, the financial and human resources to put protection at the center of its response. My third point, I think a first step to break the vicious cycle could be a concerted international effort to reopen and provide protection for schools and school children. Today, the political and strategic conflict among grown politicians and armed men has paralyzed education for young people. It must be possible to depoliticize education. Grown adults must at least agree on finding a way for children to return to school as their mothers I met before. To do this, both parties must show willingness to make compromise on the issues that so early became contentious in this conflict. UN and humanitarian partners 
also need to strengthen our efforts by the way for an effective education response. Fourth, we need to ramp up the humanitarian response. As the emergency relief coordinator well noted, many of the more than a million people who need humanitarian support now have received no assistance. A massive funding injection is needed to save lives. We need to extend the scope of the humanitarian response beyond city centers and into rural areas in south, west, and northwest regions. And the total funding for Cameroon must be ramped up. Money cannot just be shifted from other regions in Cameroon towards the crisis in the southwest and the northwest. So, as my colleagues just said, we will not act now. More lives and more hope will be lost, and the future of a generation of Cameroonians do hang in the balance. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jan, for your first-hand insights of the challenges on the ground and what the UN system and international community can do. Before we begin hearing from the Security Council, um, I would like to request that speakers limit their remarks if at all possible, um, but I now give the floor to the representative of the Dominican Republic, one of the co-hosts of today's meeting. Ambassador, you have the floor. Es para nosotros un honor copatrocinar esta actividad sobre la situación humanitaria en Camerún. Y más que un honor, es un compromiso para la República Dominicana contribuir con los esfuerzos colectivos de estas Naciones Unidas para mejorar las condiciones de vida de las poblaciones más vulnerables en ese país. Agradezco a los expositores por sus informes y propuestas de acción conjunta de parte de toda la comunidad internacional, principalmente lo apasionada, la apasionada presentación del Padre Paul y de Esther Oman sobre la situación de las mujeres y niños en Camerún. Nos preocupan las constantes amenazas que enfrenta la población civil en las zonas noroeste y sudeste del país, fruto de crecientes hostilidades y violaciones al derecho internacional humanitario. 530 mil personas han sido desplazadas. 68% de estas mujeres, mientras que los niños continúan siendo los más afectados, habiéndose reportado varios casos de violencia sexual contra mujeres y niños, así como casos de secuestro. Por causa de los repetidos ataques, 80% de las escuelas están cerradas. En consecuencia, la mayoría de los niños han tenido que interrumpir su educación por alrededor de dos a tres años. Embarazos no deseados continúan en aumento entre las jóvenes, así como un aumento del trabajo infantil. Distinguidos colegas, a principios del pasado mes de abril, la República Dominicana organizó un evento paralelo sobre el rol de los jóvenes como consolidadores de la paz y tuvimos la oportunidad de contar con un joven de Camerún como panelista, a Chaleque. Es un joven extraordinario que trabaja en la prevención del extremismo violento en su país y nos contaba la clave que es involucrar, involucrar a los jóvenes en un proceso de paz en Camerún. La República Dominicana cree fielmente que los jóvenes jugarían un papel fundamental en la solución del conflicto, pero también su participación en la acción humanitaria aseguraría su eficacia y reforzaría la capacidad de resistencia y recuperación de las comunidades en Camerún. Esto sin perder de vista la necesidad de que la acción humanitaria atienda las necesidades y las prioridades de los adolescentes y jóvenes afectados por esta crisis. Como país en desarrollo, la República Dominicana está plenamente consciente de lo que puede implicar por postergar nuestra atención y extender aún más esta crisis. Es innegable que las amenazas multidimensionales derivadas de la situación actual ponen en riesgo el cumplimiento de la Agenda 2030 y el alcance de los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible mientras atenten con la paz y la seguridad 
de toda la región centroafricana. Desde nuestro punto de vista, y para concluir, quisiera resaltar algunas ideas a los fines de contribuir para enfrentar la delicada situación humanitaria. Número uno, deben darse pasos firmes para de reducir las hostilidades y proteger a la población civil de ataques indiscriminados que cada vez más imposibilitan su bienestar y profundizan sus necesidades humanitarias, en particular las de los desplazados internos, en su mayoría mujeres, niños y niñas. Hacemos un llamado a las partes enfrentadas a respetar el derecho internacional humanitario y a abstenerse de continuar la tendencia deplorable de atacar hospitales, escuelas y trabajadores humanitarios. Número dos, exhortamos a las organizaciones regionales relevantes a que intensifiquen sus diligencias de mediación y de diálogo entre las partes, incluyendo a la sociedad civil, a los fines de cimentar la confianza y la voluntad política necesarias para construir una paz sostenible en todo el país. La participación activa de organizaciones, organizaciones como la Unión Africana es una herramienta vital para la solución pacífica e inclusiva de este conflicto. Su liderazgo, aval histórico y ejemplos de éxito sería esencial para generar la confianza y la disposición de las partes para entablar un diálogo conducente a la paz. Número tres. De manera inmediata, es preciso crear las condiciones para una acción humanitaria basada en principios que faciliten, y faciliten el acceso a tiempo sostenido y sin obstáculos. Saludamos los canales de colaboración y comunicación establecidos por el equipo país de las Naciones Unidas con las autoridades de Camerún y le aseguramos, les aseguramos nuestro decidido apoyo para continuar con esta práctica positiva en el terreno. Finalmente, nos hacemos eco del llamado de todos los expositores en el día de hoy sobre la necesidad de elevar el nivel de atención a esta crisis humanitaria al apelar por una mayor colaboración financiera para las operaciones humanitarias en Camerún. No podemos sino recordar que detrás de cada cifra, cada estadística, hay una historia humana. Hay un niño en riesgo, una mujer abatida por la violencia, un joven con un futuro incierto, toda una comunidad que pone su vida en pausa muchas veces indefinitivamente, incluso lamentables casos de pérdida de vida. Por ellos, por ellas, por todos, aunemos nuestro esfuerzo a los del pueblo de Camerún y respondamos de manera contundente con los recursos financieros necesarios para aliviar el sufrimiento de estas personas y ayudarlos a encaminar sus vidas por sendero de paz y prosperidad sostenibles. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Ambassador. I now give the floor to the representative of Germany, another one of the co-hosts of today's meeting. Ambassador, you have the floor. Yes, thanks very much, um, Madam Chair. For Germany, it was um, very important and we are very happy to co-sponsor um, today's um, event because it was very important for us that um, the situation in Cameroon is actually brought to the attention of the members of the Security Council. As Jan Egeland um, correctly said, uh, the situation is um, very, very grave, but um, it's not yet an all-out war. There is still time um, to, to do something and, and therefore, as I said, it's good that, that we are discussing it today. I would like to thank very much the speakers, um, Esther Njomo and Father Paul, you two in particular, to have um, given us a, a very depressive, very uh, terrible picture of um, the situation, but it needs these kind of presentations so that people become aware of the situation. And when you talked, it reminded me a lot about um, what we have heard before from situations of the Rohingya in, in, in Myanmar, of what we have heard of uh, suffering people in South Sudan, or what we have heard in the DRC of the women, um, um, the Yazidi women um, raped by ISIS. So it's very good that, that you are here and um, that you presented the, the terrible picture, because again, we see a situation where 
um, where rape, where the destruction of schools, where the destructions of health institutions um, are used as a means of warfare. And um, we, have to, 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 we have to do everything to, um, to stop that. And um, um, Germany will, will, will remain engaged. We, have, um, uh, we are spending about more than 60 million um, euros on the, um, on the area affected in particular by Boko Haram, but we also have special funds for um, for Cameroon, and, uh, but we are of course aware that this is, this is not, not enough. So what needs to be done, of course, is to look at the, at the root causes. One has to look at the grievances of the people that so far have not been um, addressed, in particular in the region of the northwest and the southwest that was, was presented. So we need to do basically what Jan Egeland said, or what you have said before, there needs to be um, a inclusive political dialogue um, where um, the government that does a, a number of things already, there is a list of um, what the government is doing in addressing the issue, uh, national humanitarian assistance plans, etc. But that's not enough. Um, I think there needs to be more engagement also from the UN, from us, from the region, the regional organizations, the neighbors have to be engaged. And when um, these grievances are um, addressed, it is absolutely important that those affected sit around the table, that uh, women uh, are around the table, that those affected, as I said, have to be there, civil society has to be uh, involved. And um, again, in this case, what is key is that there is accountability that those that have um, destroyed, that have looted, that have abducted, that have raped, um, actually will feel the weight of, of justice. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. I now give the floor to the representative of the United Kingdom, the last of the co-hosts of today's meeting. Ambassador, you have the floor. Well, thank you, Madam Co-Chair. Uh, and let me begin by stating that the United Kingdom is a long-standing friend and partner of Cameroon. We work closely together to tackle the devastating situation in the Lake Chad Basin, where Cameroon is a key part of regional efforts to tackle the threat from Boko Haram and IS West Africa. And Under Secretary General Mark Lowcock reminded us earlier of the generosity of Cameroon towards refu refugees not only from the Lake Chad Basin, but also from the Central African Republic. But Madam Chair, the United Kingdom is nevertheless deeply concerned about the deteriorating situation in the northwest and southwest regions of Cameroon. There have been over 1,000 mainly civilian deaths since 2016, with over 520,000 internally displaced persons from the region and 32,500 registered refugees in Nigeria. The trajectory of the need is most worrying, as Mark Lowcock said, from 160,000 last year to 1.3 million this with its disproportionate impact on children. Our Cameroonians' briefer's uh, testimony about the impact on the ground was so very powerful, and I thank you. And I also salute your bravery in coming here and speaking for your communities uh, and also for compassion, and thank you for that. As we've heard today, humanitarian access is key, which is a challenge due to ongoing fighting checkpoints and attacks on infrastructure. Armed actors on all sides have targeted national and international aid workers, curbing humanitarian work in crisis-affected areas. Health facilities have also been actively targeted. This must stop. International humanitarian law must be respected. And we must also find ways to allow education to take place, as Jan Egelin told us. We believe that senior UN officials need to maintain a visible presence in southwest and northwest regions of Cameroon to help negotiate that humanitarian space. Because there is a worrying mistrust of the aid effort on both sides, including in the Anglophone communities. Humanitarian organizations, especially from the United Nations, are often accused of supporting the government of Cameroon, while security forces and the authorities restrict movement of humanitarian workers and aid for fear of aid reaching the hands of separatists. The United Kingdom urges all parties to respect and engage in an ongoing dialogue with the humanitarian community to ensure that aid workers are able to respond in a principled and safe way. The bottom line is that those in need must be reached, 
and no one must stop that for political reasons. The United Kingdom recently gave uh, $3.25 million to the United Nations response, which will provide some assistance for people in the northwest and southwest regions. But I heard very clearly what Mark Lowcock had to say about the overall need, and we will reflect on that, and I encourage others to do so as well. Future coordination efforts between the UN agencies, funds and programs, humanitarian actors and civil society, including local humanitarian partners on the ground, should focus on a realistic plan to increase the reach of the response, including agreeing on joint approaches between the United Nations and the government of Cameroon to increase humanitarian access in rural areas. But Madam Co-Chair, this is a man-made humanitarian crisis, a crisis caused by people, not by nature, and that requires people to act to resolve it. We cannot talk about the humanitarian situation in isolation we have to also talk about the political situation which underpins it. And a number of council members, including the United Kingdom, have been highlighting for a while that there is a real risk of a long-term intractable conflict developing if it is not addressed soon. And I, at this point, remember particular uh, Father uh, Njoking Kang's words about the need for political resolution. We all want to ensure that this is avoided, this intractable conflict is avoided. Not only to stop the violence uh, described by our briefers today, but also for the sake of the region and the sub-region, given Cameroon's critical position on the continent, tackling challenges in the Lake Chad Basin and Car, as I mentioned earlier. Now, Madam Co-Chair, the government of Cameroon has made a number of promises and proposals to resolve the underlying problems. And President Beer recently promulgated a new decentralization law paving the way for regional elections. This is a very welcome step. But we need to see greater implementation of the government of Cameroon's own proposals and greater trust building with local populations. And the United Kingdom calls on the government of Cameroon to establish a credible political dialogue and make all efforts to resolve the crisis peacefully. Confidence building measures need to be taken to create the conditions for such a dialogue. For example, through release of political detainees, and taking steps to rebuild the political center. The United Kingdom stands ready to assist as a partner and in partnership with African countries and institutions. And we believe that uh, our, uh, Cameroon's neighbors, uh, the African Union, and of course, uh, UNOCA have a role to play. And I also want at this point to highlight the role of the Peace Building Support Office and to call for them to provide rapid help in responding to the government of Cameroon's request to them for assistance in the effective delivery of its own policies. Madam Co-Chair, an increase in access, an increase in funding, it's a vital first step, but it will only lead to a short-term improvement in the situation. We still have time to prevent this crisis from descending further into an intractable conflict, but that time is limited and we cannot waste it. So I reiterate the urgent need for the government of Cameroon to act now to instigate a credible dialogue, to tackle the situation and address the ever worsening humanitarian crisis. Else I fear that the council will find itself discussing this issue more often. Thank you, Madam Co-Chair. Thank you. We will now open the floor to other members of the Security Council who would like to ask questions of the panel or make comments. Equatorial Guinea, you have the floor, Mr. Ambassador. Muchas gracias, señora presidenta. En nombre de los miembros africanos del Consejo de Seguridad A3, Côte d'Ivoire, República de Sudáfrica y Guinea Ecuatorial, me gustaría aprovechar esta oportunidad para agradecer a los panelistas, al secretario general adjunto de Asuntos Humanitarios, señor Mark Lecoq, al secretario general del Consejo Noruego para los Refugiados, señor Jean Ejalan, a la señora directora ejecutiva del Reach Out Cameroon, madame Esther Omam Yomo, y al reverendo padre Paul Fru Njokikan, director de Caritas 
de la Archidiócesis de Bamenda por sus exposiciones informativas sobre la situación humanitaria en Camerún. Antes que nada, señora Presidenta, deseamos reconocer los esfuerzos de los organismos de las Naciones Unidas por su continuo apoyo a la situación humanitaria en Camerún, la cual es motivo de preocupación no solo para la subregión, sino también para todo el continente africano. En vista de lo anterior, queremos recordar que un diálogo inclusivo es la única solución para abordar cualquier diferencia que pueda surgir dentro de Camerún y esperamos que estas diferencias se resuelvan en un espíritu de cooperación y compromiso por todas las partes involucradas. Alentamos a las autoridades camerunesas a profundizar aún más en el diálogo, facilitando la participación de todas las partes relevantes por el bien común. También creemos que bajo el capítulo octavo de la Carta de las Naciones Unidas y en línea con la idea de que son los propios africanos quienes deberían resolver los problemas africanos, existen organizaciones subregionales como la Comisión del Golfo de Guinea, la Comunidad Económica de los Estados de África Central y a nivel regional la Unión Africana, a las que se les debe dar la oportunidad de involucrarse en la situación en Camerún en caso de que las autoridades lo soliciten antes que lo traten iniciativas extranjeras en otros foros. Señora Presidenta, somos conscientes de que la situación humanitaria en Camerún se ve agravada por la afluencia de refugiados como consecuencia de la situación en algunos países vecinos y en la subregión, incluyendo la persistente actividad criminal de actores no estatales. En este sentido, nos vemos alentados por el papel que juega Camerún en la lucha contra los múltiples retos a los que se enfrenta la subregión. Celebramos especialmente los esfuerzos en la negociación de un acuerdo político para la paz y la reconciliación en la República Centroafricana. Esperamos que en un futuro próximo esto traiga como resultado paz y estabilidad sostenibles a los países de la zona, con un impacto directo en la mitigación de la crisis de refugiados, así como que proporcione las condiciones necesarias para que los refugiados puedan regresar con seguridad a sus hogares. Al mismo tiempo, damos la bienvenida a las diversas medidas que han sido adoptadas por las autoridades de Camerún para hacer frente a la situación humanitaria y de seguridad. Estos esfuerzos incluyen, entre otros, el Plan Humanitario de Emergencia para asistir tanto a los desplazados internos como a los refugiados en el país, así como al Comité Nacional de Desarme, Desmovilización y, Re y, Re y Reintegración que se ocupa de la integración de los miembros de los grupos armados en el país. En este contexto, señora presidenta, es que apelamos a la comunidad internacional para que apoye los esfuerzos decisivos realizados por el gobierno de Camerún, ofreciendo el apoyo necesario para la recopilación de datos sobre las personas desplazadas, la provisión de recursos financieros para hacer frente a la totalidad de los problemas y las dificultades derivadas de esta situación humanitaria, así como el apoyo decisivo al Gobierno de la República de Camerún para encontrar una solución sostenible a las causas raíces de esta crisis. Finalmente, señora Presidenta, nos preocupa que una discusión sobre la situación humanitaria en Camerún pueda ser politizada o utilizada con fines políticos. En este sentido, deseamos desalentar estas motivaciones, ya que esto sería muy desafortunado y socavaría las perspectivas de una solución sostenible a largo plazo. Señora Presidenta, los miembros africanos del Consejo de Seguridad, A3, no creemos que la situación humanitaria en Camerún constituya una amenaza para la paz y la seguridad internacionales. En consecuencia, la situación debe ser abordada por el gobierno de Camerún con el apoyo genuino de la comunidad internacional y en línea con los deseos del pueblo camerunés. Muchas gracias.
Thank you. I now give the floor to the representative of Belgium, Ambassador. Madame la Présidente, euh, permettez-moi tout d'abord de euh, vous remercier, vous et les autres co-organisateurs, co d'avoir pris cette initiative euh, d'organiser cette réunion. Euh, la Belgique est d'avis que non seulement cette réunion est pertinente et opportune, mais elle euh, pense aussi qu'elle pourrait éventuellement consister une première étape vers un, un éventuel suivi ultérieur du Conseil de sécurité dans un esprit naturellement de prévention de conflits et de médiation. Je tiens également à remercier vivement euh, les intervenants pour leur exposé éclairant et très poignant. Euh, Madame la Présidente, je me concentre aujourd'hui sur quelques points et je vais aussi après euh, poser euh, deux questions. Primo, euh, nous sommes d'avis qu'il ne faut pas sous-estimer, comme euh, tous les interlocuteurs l'ont fait, euh, l'importance de la crise humanitaire au Cameroun. La Belgique est préoccupée par les ramifications croissantes de la crise humanitaire tant au niveau national que régional. Outre les problèmes des régions anglophones, la catastrophe humanitaire découle également du fléau terroriste de Boko Haram et des répercussions de la situation en République centrafricaine ou de troubles au Nigeria. En même temps, nous devons reconnaître que la crise humanitaire, comme l'a si, si bien euh, euh, comme, comme cela a été si bien dit par M. Lowcock, euh, reste l'une des plus euh, sous-financées au monde. Le financement disponible ne représente que la moitié des budgets requis et une action urgente s'impose donc. Par ailleurs, la crise humanitaire actuelle est étroitement liée à la crise des droits de l'homme qui est en cours au Cameroun. Les abus et violations des droits de l'homme doivent faire l'objet d'une enquête rapide et approfondie. Les auteurs doivent être tenus responsables. La récente visite de la haute commissaire Madame Bachelet a montré des signes encourageants de la volonté du Cameroun de coopérer avec les Nations unies pour trouver des solutions. Nous espérons que cela sera le prélude à une coopération plus étroite avec les mécanismes régionaux et internationaux des droits de l'homme. Euh, secondo, mon deuxième message concerne donc les solutions apportées particulièrement à la crise des régions anglophones. Nous sommes d'avis qu'un seul, un dialogue inclusif et engagé entre les parties camerounaises peut permettre les progrès nécessaires. La déclaration du Premier ministre jeudi passé que son gouvernement était disposé à dialoguer avec les séparatistes armés est un important signal à cet égard. Des actions concrètes doivent suivre. Vu la nature holistique de la crise, nous avons tous à y apporter une réponse, à la fois au niveau sous-régional, régional, au niveau des Nations unies, mais également au niveau des États membres et des acteurs humanitaires, religieux et confessionnels. Cette réponse doit être coordonnée en dialogue étroit avec les, autres, avec les autorités camerounaises. La Belgique reste tout à fait disposée, elle aussi, à soutenir un tel dialogue. En tant qu'État fédéral, nous pouvons partager notre expérience en matière de décentralisation et de promotion du bilinguisme. Dans l'attente d'un tel dialogue, il reste absolument primordial que les acteurs humanitaires et des ONG concernés bénéficient d'un plein accès aux personnes déplacées et aux réfugiés en conformité avec le droit international humanitaire. De plus, nous devons nous investir collectivement afin d'assurer des moyens financiers adéquats pour pouvoir faire face à cette crise, notamment en soutenant les capacités de négociation des différentes communautés affectées. Enfin, la Belgique souhaite également saisir cette occasion pour poser quelques questions sur la voie à suivre. Comme l'a dit la haute commissaire des Nations Unies aux droits de l'homme, Madame Bachelet, à l'issue de sa visite au Cameroun, les enjeux sont élevés non seulement pour le Cameroun, mais pour la région. À cet égard, nous sommes convaincus que le résumé de cette réunion ARIA par le président pourrait constituer la base d'un suivi plus régulier. Le Conseil devra également recevoir le rapport régulier concernant le Bureau régional des Nations Unies pour l'Afrique centrale et la Belgique s'attend à ce que des informations sur la situation au Cameroun y soient reprises. Euh, pour ce qui concerne mes questions, nous restons également préoccupés 
par le manque de données indépendantes des Nations Unies à propos de cette crise. Nous nous demandons comment et par qui cela pourrait être, cela pourrait être fait. Enfin, comment les intervenants voient-ils le potentiel d'une implication accrue de l'Union africaine ou de la CEAC dans la crise camerounaise Je vous remercie, Madame la Présidente. Thank you very much. I now give the floor to the representative of Peru. Sí. Muchas gracias, señora presidenta. Mi delegación desea agradecer a los organizadores de esta reunión y a los oradores invitados por sus detalladas e informativas presentaciones. La reunión de hoy nos brinda la oportunidad de reflexionar conjuntamente sobre medidas para enfrentar la preocupante situación de seguridad y la crisis humanitaria que vive el Camerún. Con más de 4.3 millones de personas en necesidad, más de la mitad de ellos niños y niñas. Nos preocupa particularmente el conflicto existente en las regiones noroccidental y sudoccidental, donde la escalada de violencia afecta además a los servicios de salud y educación y obstruye obstaculiza la prestación de ayuda humanitaria. Junto con ello, el país se ve gravemente afectado por las crisis relacionadas a las luchas contra el Boko Haram en la cuenca del lago Chad, el Estado Islámico en el África Occidental, la masiva movilización de medio millón de desplazados internos y de los refugiados provenientes de la República Centroafricana y Nigeria. Frente a ello, consideramos indispensable lo siguiente. En primer lugar, garantizar el acceso y la seguridad de las personas que brindan asistencia humanitaria y de los observadores de derechos humanos nacionales e internacionales en todas las zonas del país. En segundo lugar, hacemos un llamado a todas las partes al estricto cumplimiento del derecho internacional de los derechos humanos y el derecho internacional humanitario, en línea con los convenios de Ginebra de 1949. Particularmente, resaltamos la necesidad del cese de los ataques a la infraestructura vial como hospitales y otros establecimientos sanitarios de acuerdo a la resolución 2286 de este Consejo. En tercer lugar, resulta indispensable dotar a la asistencia humanitaria con un financiamiento previsible, sostenible y flexible a fin de asegurar una respuesta eficaz en beneficio de los más necesitados. En cuarto lugar, Queremos destacar la necesidad de que el Gobierno adopte las medidas necesarias para entablar un diálogo inclusivo, constructivo y sostenible, con miras a resolver las cuestiones subyacentes y adoptar medidas de fomento de la confianza a fin de crear un clima positivo hacia ese propósito. Saludamos en ese sentido los recientes anuncios realizados por el presidente Paul Villa. Señora Presidenta, para concluir, Deseamos referirnos a lo indicado por la Alta Comisionada de los Derechos Humanos tras su reciente visita al Camerún, respecto a los desafíos inmensos que enfrenta este país, pero al mismo tiempo su voluntad para propiciar, en conjunción con las Naciones Unidas, la búsqueda de soluciones efectivas a estas crisis. Este es un compromiso significativo que requerirá del sostenido apoyo de las organizaciones regionales y de la comunidad internacional en su conjunto. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. I now give the floor to the ambassador from Poland. Ambassador. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would like to thank the organizer for this very timely meeting and allow me also to thank our distinguished briefers for their comprehensive presentations. Madam Chair, Keeping in mind how important international contributor to peacekeeping operations and partner in the fight against Islamic terrorist Cameroon is, we are deeply concerned about the deteriorating humanitarian situation in the country. Increasing insecurity and instability in the country, as well as devastating climate change for thousands, of Cameroonians to leave their homes. The growing number of refugees and internally displaced persons 
results in a certain humanitarian needs, both for displaced populations and vulnerable host communities. The humanitarian situation is particularly complex, mostly due to three different emergencies on the ground of different nature. Firstly, the insecurity and arrival of refugees in the far north region due to Boko Haram insurgency, as Cameroon is the second most affected country by the Lake Chad Bassein crisis. Secondly, crisis linked to incoming refugees from Central African Republic in the eastern regions without close prospect for their return home. And thirdly, crisis in the northwest and southwest English-speaking regions where the spire of conflict winds up and already started bear signs of regular civil war. According to the reports, civilians in the English-speaking regions are victims of extrajudicial killings, abductions, restriction of movement, and access to health. The situation has also an adverse impact on the education system, posing a risk of even more serious problems for a whole generation of young Cameroonians. Gradual deterioration of social cohesion in Cameroon against that backdrop of incitement to ethnic hatred and intercommunal violence becomes a serious problem before our eyes and it can not be neglected. All above mentioned difficulties generates a great need for urgent long-term solutions both for refugees and hosting communities. Therefore, Poland calls all the parties on the ground to take immediate steps to prevent any further violence and to work together in good faith, including through a process of open and inclusive dialogue to reduce the tensions and to devise long-term political ag agreement. In this context, we recognize the strategic role of regional organizations in reducing tensions on the ground and encourage the African Union to use all its mediation efforts and good offices to support reaching a real agreement. At the same time, we emphasize the importance of allowing full humanitarian access, also for human rights monitors and of coordination of action taken in this regard. We urge all the fully comply with their obligation under the international humanitarian and human rights law. In conclusion, Madam Chair, let us reiterate that there is no peace without justice. Thus, full accountability for all those responsible for human rights violations and abuses on the ground must be ensured. Thank you. Thank you. I now give the floor to the representative of France. Ambassador, you have the floor. Madam la Presidente, <coughs> Je tiens tout d'abord à remercier nos quatre briefeurs pour leurs exposés très utiles et éclairants. La France est très préoccupée par la dégradation de la situation humanitaire au Cameroun, en particulier dans les régions du nord-ouest et du sud-ouest, mais aussi dans l'extrême nord du pays, en raison de l'action de Boko Haram, et dans l'est du pays, en raison de l'impact de la crise centrafricaine. Je ne reviendrai pas ici sur les chiffres qui viennent de nous être exposés, ils parlent d'eux-mêmes, mais je souhaiterais mettre en avant trois axes d'action <coughs> sur lesquels nous devons collectivement concentrer nos efforts. Le premier axe est la protection des civils, y compris des personnels humanitaires et médicaux, qui doit être une priorité absolue pour tous. Les attaques contre les civils qui sont pris pour cible et la forte hausse des attaques contre les personnels humanitaires et médicaux ainsi que les infrastructures de santé et les écoles sont très préoccupantes. Il est impératif que les civils soient protégés des violences et que le droit international humanitaire et les droits de l'homme soient respectés. Cet impératif s'impose à tous et n'est pas négociable. 
Il est par ailleurs essentiel que des enquêtes, que des enquêtes impartiales soient menées pour faire la lumière sur les violations et que les responsables rendent des comptes devant la justice, quelle que soit leur affiliation. Le deuxième axe, Madame la Présidente, est la garantie des accès humanitaires sur l'ensemble du territoire. <coughs> Plus d'une personne sur six au Cameroun a besoin d'une aide humanitaire. Nous devons tout faire pour garantir un accès humanitaire immédiat, sûr, sans entrave et durable, à l'ensemble des personnes dans le besoin, en particulier les femmes et les enfants, ainsi que les réfugiés et les déplacés internes qui sont dans une situation de grande vulnérabilité. Il est essentiel que les personnels humanitaires et médicaux puissent avoir accès à ces personnes afin de mener une évaluation appropriée des besoins et d'apporter à ces personnes une assistance humanitaire. Enfin, notre troisième axe d'action consiste à promouvoir la stabilisation des zones affectées du Cameroun afin de mettre un terme à cette crise humanitaire en appui des efforts des autorités camerounaises. Face aux facteurs divers qui contribuent à cette détresse humanitaire, les efforts de stabilisation doivent être à la fois concertés et complémentaires entre eux. C'est pourquoi nous appelons à poursuivre la lutte contre Boko Haram dans le bassin du lac Tchad. C'est pourquoi nous appelons par ailleurs à continuer à œuvrer collectivement pour une paix durable en République centrafricaine. C'est pourquoi nous encourageons enfin pleinement les autorités camerounaises à intensifier leurs efforts pour lancer un dialogue politique inclusif concernant les régions du Nord-Ouest et du Sud-Ouest. Nous appelons également l'ensemble des acteurs à cesser les violences et à assurer la restauration de l'état de droit. Les récentes annonces du Premier ministre camerounais sont à cet égard encourageantes. Nous formons le vœu qu'elles soient mises en œuvre sans retard. Madame la Présidente, la France continuera à contribuer à la réponse à la crise humanitaire au Cameroun, tant à titre bilatéral que via l'Union européenne. Le Cameroun est pour nous tous un partenaire essentiel et un pays clé dans cette région. Nous devons collectivement continuer à lui apporter notre plein soutien pour l'encourager dans la voie du dialogue et l'aider à surmonter cette crise. Vous pouvez compter sur l'engagement déterminé et résolu de la France en ce sens. Je vous remercie. Thank you. I now give the floor to the representative of Kuwait. You have the floor. شكرا السيد رئيس. أتقدم بالشكر لوفود الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية وجمهورية ألمانيا الاتحادية وجمهورية الدومينيكان ومملكة المتحدة على تنظيم هذه الجلسة. والشكر موصول كذلك للمقدم الإحاطات على مداخلتهم حول هذا المعروض الموضوع المعروض أمامنا. يأتي انعقاد هذا الاجتماع في ظل ما تشهده الساحة الدولية من تحديات متصاعدة تهدد السلم والأمن الدوليين أصبحت أكثر تعقيدا وتشابكا مما كانت عليه في السابق والتي تتطلب قيام الأمم المتحدة بكافة أجهزتها وتسخير أدواتها للتعاطي مع الأزمات خاصة في مراحلها الأولية وذلك عبر الحوار وبالطرق والوسائل السلمية المستندة على أحكام القانون الدولي وقرارات الشرعية الدولية ومبادئ حقوق الإنسان فيوسفنا ما آلت إليه الأوضاع الإنسانية في منطقة أفريقيا الوسطى نتيجة لارتفاع عدد المحتاجين للمساعدات الإنسانية العاجلة فضلا عن زيادة أعداد اللاجئين وتفشي الأوبئة كالكوليرا والإيبولا وغيرها من الأمراض ونتفق مع الجميع هنا بأن الوضع الإنساني في الكاميرون صعب للقاية نظرا لحاجة ما يقارب 4.3 مليون شخص إلى مساعدات الإنسانية والتي تمثل زيادة قدرها 30% مقارنة بالعام الماضي بالإضافة إلى نزوح ما يقارب إلى 800 ألف نازح فضلا عن وجود العديد من اللاجئين من دول الجوار والذي بلغ عددهم 380 ألف لاجئ وفق التقارير الأممية أي بزيادة تقدر ب 82% مقارنة بالعام الماضي 
نظرا لما تواجهه المنطقة عامة والكاميرون خاصة من تحديات أمنية وإنسانية تنظر بحدوث كارثة إنسانية ما لم يتم التعامل معها عاجلا فضلا عن وضع حلول لمعالجتها سيد رئيس تؤمن بلادي الكويت بالدبلوماسية الوقائية والحوار والوساطة بوصفها أدوات هامة لتفادي النزاعات والحد من المعاناة الإنسانية ولتجنب الكثير من الخسائر والأضرار المادية والبشرية فقد تابعنا الأحداث في الكاميرون ونحث هنا كافة الأطراف المعنية بالالتزام بالقانون الدولي الإنساني والقانون الدولي لحقوق الإنسان ونشجع على معالجة هذه الأوضاع عن طريق الحوار وتغليب روح المسؤولية والتعاون البناء وإبداء حسن النية لتجنب أي تداعيات مستقبلية تؤثر على أمن واستقرار المنطقة آخذين بعين الاعتبار مصلحة البلاد وحقوق الشعب في حياة حرة وكريمة ونشاطر هنا الأمين العام قلقه البالق إزاء تدهور الحالة الأمنية والإنسانية في المنطقة الشمالية الغربية والمنطقة الجنوبية الغربية من الكاميرون وندعو الحكومة الكاميرونية بالتعاون مع المنظمات الإقليمية والدولية لبذل المزيد من الجهد لمعالجة وتحسين الوضع الإنساني بما يخدم مصلحة الشعب الكاميروني الصديق فالوضع الإنساني سيواصل تدهوره والاحتياجات الإنسانية ستستمر في الزيادة حال عدم وقف الأطراف المعنية أعمال العنف والبدء في مفاوضات رامية إلى تحقيق حل مستدام وفي الختام سيد رئيس نرى بأن بأنه يمكن للأمم المتحدة أن تلعب دورا محوريا للوفاء بمسؤولياتها في قيادة تلك الجهود الدولية في مجال تقديم المساعدة الإنسانية في إطار خطة الاستجابة الإنسانية لعام 2019 والتي أطلقتها الحكومة الكاميرونية بالتعاون مع الأمم المتحدة وشركائها في المجال الإنساني ونؤكد على أهمية استمرار الجهود التي يبذلها كافة الشركاء الإنسانيين بما في ذلك منظمة التعاون الإسلامي التي سبق أن شكلت تحالفا إنسانيا للحد من المخاطر الإنسانية وتخفيف المعاناة الإنسانية عن الشعب الكاميروني فضلا عن إشاعة السلام وتحقيق المصالحة الوطنية بين الأطراف المتنازعة وستواصل دولة الكويت دعم تلك المساعي الحميدة فإن جمهورية الكاميرون تربطنا بها علاقات صداقة وتعاون طيبة ونأمل بأن لا يتطور الوضع الراهن ليخل بالاستقرار وأن يؤدي إلى المزيد من العنف بل نتطلع إلى تخطيها لهذه المرحلة الصعبة وشكرا السيد الرئيس Thank you. I now give the floor to the representative of Indonesia. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. At the outset, I would like to thank the United States for initiating this meeting and recognize the other co-hosts, Germany, UK, and the Dominican Republic. I would also like to thank all the briefers for their very comprehensive uh, briefing. Allow me to make three pertinent points. First, the need for humanitarian response in Cameroon. Second, the need for cooperation with the government of Cameroon and also inclusive dialogue. And thirdly, the role of regional organization for Cameroon. First, I entirely agree with uh, the briefers, the panelists, that there is a, pre a pressing need for humanitarian response in Cameroon. From the report of UNOCHA, Indonesia notes that funding for such response is at an all-time low. In February, the government and the humanitarian community launched the 2019 Humanitarian Response Plan, requesting for 298 million to assist 2.3 million people. As of now, only 11% of the funds has been received. While on the same time, today, 3 million people are severely food insecurity in Cameroon. 1.5 million in northwest and southwest regions alone. Among them are 222,000 children. In far north region, one in two people does not have enough to eat. In 2018, 78,000 children under five years were treated for severe malnutrition. We urge the international community to fulfill their humanitarian commitment. 
Indonesia views the importance of inclusive dialogue involving all stakeholders in finding durable solutions. In this regard, Indonesia joins the UN High Commissioner on Human Rights, Madam Masili Basili, in welcoming Cameroon's willingness to cooperate over finding workable solutions to major human rights and humanitarian crises. Thirdly, Indonesia adhere to the principle of neighbors know best. To this extent, as a natural first responder, the African Union and other sub-regional organizations play a very important role in enabling the government of Cameroon to resolve this crisis. Madam Chair, as the threat of extremist organizations continues to exist in the country and in the region, cooperation between neighboring states is becoming very important. For the rest of the international community, it is important to continue the dialogue with Cameroon to understand how they can play their role. In this regard, Indonesia supports the work of the Special Representative and Head of UN Regional Office for Central Africa, UNOCA, His Excellency Francois Lonseni Fall. We look forward to his report on the situation of the region and the cooperation between neighboring states. Finally, I would like to use this opportunity to pose a question to the panelists on how is the current working relations between the UN and regional organizations such as UNOCA in assisting the humanitarian situation in Cameroon, including on how can such working relations be enhanced. I thank you very much. Thank you very much. And we will come back to the questions. Um, I now give the floor to the representative of China. Thank you. Thank Gai 不能干涉卡麦隆内政相信卡方有能力依法保障社会秩序和公民权益。实现民族团结和国家长治久安。谢谢主席女士。Thank you. And now give the floor to the representative of Russia. Give the floor. Благодарю госпожа председатель, уважаемые коллеги. Положение дел в Камеруне, ранее отличавшееся относительной стабильностью, в последние годы заметно осложнилось. Причинами этого стали общее ухудшение положения в зоне Сахеля, неурегулированность конфликта соседний ЦАР, рост пиратства в Гвинейском заливе, заметная активизация трансграничной террористической группировки Бока Харам, совершающей нападение теракты, в том числе на территории Камеруна, а также деградация гуманитарной ситуации в связи с увеличением количества беженцев из соседних стран. К сожалению, вынуждены констатировать нарастание напряженности в англоязычных, юго-западной и северо-западной провинциях Камеруна. На наш взгляд, сложившаяся там непростая ситуация не является результатом недавних событий. Раздел бывших колониальных владений европейских государств без учета религиозных, лингвистических и этнических различий заложил немало очагов напряженности на африканском континенте. Камерун не стал исключением. Обеспокоены тем, что конфликта потенциал выходит за, за пределы англоговорящих регионов и охватывает другие области страны. Приветствуем в этой связи предпринимаемые властями меры по стабилизации ситуации. И призываем все стороны воздерживаться от любых действий, которые могут привести к дальнейшей деградации обстановки. 
Считаем, что решение внутренних проблем в Камеруне может быть найдено за столом переговоров при соблюдении прав человека и обеспечении верховенства закона. Хотели бы обратить внимание, что принимая решение по такому нестандартному формату обсуждения страновой гум-ситуации, организаторы должны были бы в первую очередь задаться вопросом, какую пользу данный шаг принесет гумагентствам ООН, работающим в стране. На наш взгляд, эта встреча едва ли будет способствовать налаживанию диалога резидента, координатора и гуманитарных агентств с властями страны пребывания. Хотели бы подчеркнуть, важно не перейти грань между превенцией и вмешательством во внутренние дела. Убеждены, что камерунцы способны справиться со сложившейся ситуацией своими силами. При необходимости с поддержкой со стороны субрегиональных организаций и Афросоюза. Со своей стороны готовы оказать им в этом помощь, но только в том случае, если наши камерунские партнеры сочтут это необходимым. На данном же этапе все камерунские стороны должны сосредоточиться на субстантивном национальном диалоге. Благодарю вас. Thank you. I will now give the floor to other representatives that the co-hosts have invited to speak. I will now give the floor to the representative of Cameroon. Ambassador, you have the floor. Ambassador Sharit, Madame la Présidente, je vous remercie de me donner la parole à mon tour. D'entrée de jeu, je voudrais vous dire que la présente réunion sous formule ARIA ne rencontre pas l'adhésion du Cameroun. Est-il encore besoin de rappeler que la même objection a déjà été fortement exprimée par de nombreux pays du Conseil en particulier les pays africains, en raison de son caractère équivoque, susceptible d'être malicieusement exploité par des esprits malveillants, confondant à l'envie et pour leur cause cette formule avec les réunions officielles du Conseil. J'illustre, ambassadeur Chine. Lorsque vous et moi, nous nous sommes longuement vus et que je vous ai exprimé cette exploitation malveillante, peut-être vous ne m'avez pas cru. Depuis le début de cet après-midi, dans les réseaux sociaux, il est dit que le Conseil de sécurité a siégé, a adopté une résolution et que les voies se sont établies comme suite. Pour le Cameroun, France, Côte d'Ivoire, Belgique, Guinée équatoriale, neutre, Chine, contre le Cameroun, États-Unis d'Amérique, Royaume-Uni, Russie, Allemagne, Indonésie, Pérou, Koweït, Pologne, Afrique du Sud, République dominicaine. Et que ce faisant, le Cameroun a été battu. Voilà, ambassadeur chéri, les confusions pour lesquelles je vous avais fait euh, l'amitié de vous dire toute ma précaution. Maintenant, voilà ce qui se dit dans les réseaux sociaux, que le Conseil a siégé. Un. En outre, le sujet même sous examen, à savoir la situation humanitaire au Cameroun, a-t-on suffisamment répété ne constitue en rien une menace à la paix et à la sécurité internationale. Et je remercie encore les membres du Conseil qui l'ont répété tout à l'heure. Un tel sujet, un tel sujet aurait été plus indiqué dans le segment humanitaire du Conseil économique et social ou dans les débats sur les questions humanitaires à la troisième commission de l'Assemblée générale voire lors d'une manifestation parallèle de haut niveau au cours de l'Assemblée générale. C'était le cadre idoine. D'aucuns ont avancé l'argument de prévention. Quelle prévention alors pourrait-on s'écrier Et quelle serait la ligne de démarcation 
entre prévention et volonté d'intervention sous des prétextes humanitaires qui hantent certains esprits. Sans doute, certains sont venus à cette rencontre avec l'encre appropriée pour peindre le Cameroun tout en noir, pays d'enfer et de mots indicibles. Et ils ont en cela à mettre les médias, les ONG et les marcheurs patentés de la 47e rue pour spontanément amplifier leur vue dans les médias et les réseaux sociaux. Certains d'entre ces déstabilisateurs ont d'ailleurs tout récemment publié un communiqué affirmant que tout participant à notre prochaine fête nationale du 20 mai sera placé sur leur liste noire et traité comme ennemi et que l'insurrection est le seul moyen actuel pour renverser les institutions du Cameroun et ceux qui les incarnent. C'est écrit noir sur blanc. D'autres, peut-être aussi, sont venus à cette réunion munis de siphons pour siphonner toute l'eau de la bouteille et présenter le Cameroun comme une bouteille toujours vide, au plus à moitié vide. D'autres, que sais-je encore, sont venus verser d'abondantes larmes sur la situation humanitaire. Il y a eu de vraies larmes, nous les avons vues et entendues. Mais en réalité, il y a eu d'autres larmes feintes, à peine voilées sur une situation dont ces gens n'ignorent pas s'ils ne provoquent d'ailleurs pas les tenants et les aboutissants. D'autres, enfin, sont venus à la présente rencontre, sans doute à la recherche de marché pour leur ONG, en gonflant à souhait les chiffres des besoins humanitaires. Quant à nous et à nos partenaires réellement sincères et soucieux de la transparence, et nous en avons entendu un grand nombre tout à l'heure, nous sommes donc soucieux de la traçabilité, bref, de l'efficacité de l'aide humanitaire et nous sommes venus dire à cette réunion sur ce point-là que le Cameroun est debout, têtu comme la vérité, visant l'émergence en 2035. Pays qui n'est pas au paradis, j'entends, mais pays qui n'est pas en enfer non plus, mais pays qui est bien sur la terre des hommes, cherchant patiemment et méthodiquement sa voie de développement endogène. En cette période charnière où les réalités et les survivances du XXe siècle s'imbriquent encore dans celles du XXIe siècle, s'affirme dans un contexte où les rivalités de puissance, d'intérêt et d'idéologie vont crescendo dans diverses parties du monde. Dans une Afrique qui se projette à l'horizon 2063 comme un continent prospère, libre, uni, paisible et acteur majeur dans les relations internationales. C'est à la lumière de toutes ces considérations et de leçons tirées de l'expérience dans de nombreux pays que nous abordons la question sous examen qui requiert toute l'attention de notre gouvernement. Le Cameroun est un pays ouvert qui a successivement reçu ces derniers temps le haut commissaire des Nations Unies aux droits de l'homme, une délégation du Commonwealth, le président de la Commission de l'Union africaine, une délégation de l'Organisation internationale de la francophonie est attendue et le Parlement européen est invité. Un des distingués invités, à savoir le représentant spécial du secrétaire général pour l'Afrique centrale, n'a pas manqué de déclarer à la suite d'une de ses visites. Je cite, « Nous sommes venus rencontrer le premier ministre, chef du gouvernement, pour faire avec lui le point de la situation au Cameroun. Monsieur le Premier ministre nous a fait le point des efforts déployés 
pour la stabilisation des régions du nord-ouest et du sud-ouest. Nous partons d'ici avec l'assurance que le gouvernement est à pied d'œuvre pour trouver des solutions idoines dans ces deux régions. Fin de citation. La devise du Cameroun est « Paix, travail, patrie ». For many years, it had been hosting a large number of refugees and displaced persons on its soil due to the occasional, recurrent, or persistent conflicts in neighboring countries. Recently, the flow of displaced persons has increased as a result of the action of war and the stabilization agent in these main, in three main fronts. One, the Boko Haram front, terrorism, aimed at installing a caliphate in the far north region. The front of the secession, animated by a group of separatists aiming to create in the northwest and southwest region a so-called Federal Republic of Ambassonia and the third from the front of salvation, aiming at challenging, destabilizing, and overthrowing the institution of the country, as well as the people who embody them. Such a situation has increased the demand for humanitarian assistance. It has, as, it has sometimes been equivocal about the number of refugee and displaced persons. It should be emphasized that the government is working, so is working to register and control this flow and thus have its position figures different from those usually available and quoted. Political will, commitment, and accompanying measure. The government concerned at the highest level immediately mobilized itself and promptly set up in Ter Alia an emergency humanitarian assistance plan of about 12 billion CFA, 23 million US dollar worth. It is worth mentioning that the spontaneous contribution of citizens well-wisher as well as the state budget have made a substantial contribution to this plan, thus keeping momentum of national solidarity towards the affected population. One should recall that this plan covers all the region impacted by the flows of refugee and IDP, but specifically is centered to the northwest and southern region implementation and result of the emergency plan. To date, this plan, which target early humanitarian response and the resilience of the affected communities is being actively implemented. In cooperation with the coordinator of the United Nations country team in the field, the Minister of Territorial Administration has recently formulate a platform for joint action for maximum efficiency, enhanced transparency, tracking, and security of humanitarian aid in the country. The various teams formed for this purpose under the coordination of the Minister of Territorial Administration and in the framework of the civil protection have made several field visits <laughs> under the protection of the army in all the regions concerned. In particular, 34 subdivisions in the Northwest and 31 in the Southwest. 150,000 families of internally displaced persons have been duly identified and 75,000 have already received assistance. Thus, necessity, necessities about these 70, 75,000 families, as mentioned above, have benefited from mattresses, blankets, full stop, and toiletries. 
agricultural material, fertilizer, hose, showers, machete, reconstruction of houses, construction material consisting of cement, timber, sheet steel, nails, educational, school material have been made available to families at the beginning of school year and in order to ensure the continuity of schooling for displaced children, measures have been taken such as registration without birth certificate, exceptional uh, exception of school fees. In this realm, an operation targeting 1,400 families is underway in Kumba and Manfe in the southwest region, as well as in Santa, Kambe, Mazija, and Butikum in the northwest region. To cover the needs of external displaced persons, large stocks of mat mattresses, blankets, and foodstuff are stored in several warehouses in Douala, Yaoundé, Bamenda, and Zamengwe. Way forward, the active continuation of the implementation of this emergency plan requires an appropriate solution to some of the difficulties encountered and additional support from various partners. In the number of difficulties in tackling the humanitarian situation, one can underline, one, the collection of accurate data on the ground. In fact, the administrative and traditional authorities are facing difficulties in the field of humanitarian assistance, particularly in the identification of internal dispersed persons because they are concealed in the community or are sometimes reluctant to register with the administrative authority for fear of terrorist retaliation. Two, problem relating to operational resources. I want to indicate that additional resources are needed to enable civil protection management teams cover in a frequent and satisfactory manner all the areas where the displaced persons are located, such as the subdivision before mentioned. Furthermore, the budgetary estimate or assumption that have support the emergency plan must constantly be adjusted and updated in the light of variability prices of the uh, various products needed for assistance to internally dispersed persons in the context of economic and financial security hazard. Cameroon sees this opportunity to thank all partners who have already contributed to the government emergency plan and call for increased support from bilateral and multilateral sources. Above, above all, above all, one of the areas where we need assistance to tackle the root cause of the problem, we need more assistance and support in order to identify and block the sources of financing for terrorism, secessionism, subversion, and insurgency. On the other hand, so additional resources to spray up the eradication of poverty and the creation of well-being for all. The government of Cameroon is fully, fully aware of the cause of this situation and reiterate the commitment and measures taken by President Paul Bia, as well as those recently adopted by Parliament to strengthen dialogue, accelerate the process of decentralization, and empower region in a country where peace, stability, unity, territorial integrity in a confessional, linguistic, ethnic, cultural diversity, and living together are constantly nurtured 
and strengthen. Cameroon leads a methodical fight against terrorism, secessionism, subversion, insurgency in strict compliance with the text, instrument, commitment, and law governing human rights. Je veux donner deux explications à certaines questions qui ont été soulevées. Accès des humanitaires aux, euh, aux, aux populations déplacées ou aux réfugiés. Le Cameroun est ouvert en cela. Il veut tout simplement que les équipes qui se déplacent soient tout à fait encadrées de peur de tomber ces équipes elles-mêmes aux mains des terroristes comme quoi la communauté internationale va nous reprocher de n'avoir pas protégé les humanitaires. Et je vous ai dit que, tout récemment, une plateforme de traçabilité, de contrôle a été établie avec le gouvernement et les Nations unies. Ça, c'est pour l'accès. Il y a question de violence. J'ai entendu dans tous les exposés tout à l'heure les, les, les orateurs parler de violence. Et certains même sont allés jusqu'à incriminer le gouvernement en disant que le gouvernement était de nature flexible et attaquait les populations. Je donne à un de mes collaborateurs, Madame Ambassadeur Chéry, ce document qu'il vous remette pour le Conseil et vous verrez les actes de violence de la part des, des Boko Haram et de la part de ceux qui nous provoquent du point de vue de la sécession. Euh, également, Je voudrais dire que tout à l'heure, lorsque les présentateurs ont fait leur sujet, à la porte, le sujet de cette réunion est Area Formula Meeting de Humanitarian Situation in Cameroun. On a parlé de crise et on a centré tout cela sur le sud-ouest et le nord-ouest. J'ai entendu de manière furtive allusion à d'autres régions, ce qui fait donc que le sujet n'était pas abordé comme tel Et on comprend donc qu'on est venu chercher noise et chercher les poux sur la tête et les chics dans les pieds du Cameroun, ce qui n'est pas tout à fait approprié. Je voudrais conclure en disant aussi que nous avons une administration debout. Et je suis tout à fait encouragé par ceux qui ont dit que mieux vaut approcher le Cameroun demander à son gouvernement, demander à tout ce qui est fait, qu'est-ce qu'il y a lieu de faire. Je vous ai indiqué tout à l'heure, dans le plan de mise en œuvre de notre plan humanitaire, je vous ai indiqué ce par quoi nous voulons être aidés. Nous ne voulons pas des gens qui travaillent pour le Cameroun, mais nous voulons les gens qui travaillent avec le Cameroun. C'est très différent. Nous ne sommes pas par terre, nous sommes là, vivants. Et nous souhaitons que les gens travaillent avec nous pour mettre fin à ces termes. Euh, j'ai entendu aussi les cris de désespoir, euh, qu'il y a euh, non-fréquentation, qu'on ne se parle pas. Euh, j'invite les membres du Conseil à regarder la visite l'année, la semaine dernière du Premier ministre sur le terrain. Enthousiasme de la population. Le Premier ministre a mangé un dîner fort copieux chez M. Nifrundi, qui est un, une figure de l'opposition camerounaise bien connue, dont nous parlons, nous dialoguons. Et le Premier ministre a annoncé en même temps que les centres qui ont été ouverts, ceux qui ont déjà rejoint ces centres, ils seront reçus par le Président. Le Premier ministre a annoncé, d'ailleurs, que ce n'est pas ce que vous voyez dans les centres qui sont ceux qui sont sortis de Bruce. Il y a beaucoup qui sont sortis et sont allés directement dans d'autres régions de nos pays et qui sont hébergés. Donc, Il y a un grand nombre de gens qui se rallient et qui comprennent maintenant qu'ils ont été trompés. Je voudrais que le Conseil ait un œil tout à fait réaliste sur ce genre de situation. Nous dialoguons à tous les niveaux. Et le Premier ministre l'a encore prouvé dans le Nord et le Sud-Ouest en dialoguant tout azimut. J'en ai terminé. Madame l'ambassadeur, je vous remercie de m'avoir donné la parole. J'ai été tout aussi passionné comme d'habitude parce qu'il s'agit de mon pays et parce que nous le connaissons mieux que quiconque. Et ce matin, le ministre de Relations extérieures a publié un communiqué que je vous ai envoyé à vous tous pour montrer que le Cameroun est gouverné. Nous faisons face à la sécession, nous faisons face au terrorisme, 
nous faisons ça à l'insurrection et nous y ferons face. Nous sommes des hommes dont les pieds reprennent vigueur en refrappant le sol dur. Je vous remercie. Thank you, Ambassador. And last but not least, I give, now give the floor to the representative of the European Union. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have the honor to speak on behalf of the European Union and its member states. Uh, the following countries align themselves with my statement. The candidate countries North Macedonia, Serbia and Albania. The country of the stabilization and association process and potential candidate Bosnia and Herzegovina as well as the Republic of Moldova. I'd like to thank you. I'd like to thank those who initiated this meeting and all the briefers for their contribution. Uh, the European Union is concerned about the rapid deterioration of the humanitarian situation in Cameroon. Cameroon faces three major humanitarian crises, which affect eight out of the 10 regions of the country. These crises have caused a widespread disruption of the economic activities and a massive displacement of population. Latest figures show that there are some 1.2 million forcibly displaced in the country. Eastern Cameroon suffers a first from a protracted refugee crisis since 2013, hosting a large population of refugees from the Central African Republic in need not only of humanitarian assistance, but also of long-term development aid, considering the protracted nature of their situation. Secondly, another area of Cameroon, the far north region, is affected by the Lake Chad crisis. As a result of violence in northeast Nigeria, Cameroon has received an important influx of refugees from Nigeria, and many Cameroonians have been forced to flee their places of origin and, and are internally displaced. All these displaced populations are also in need of humanitarian aid. Finally, the humanitarian crisis in the northwest and southwest regions, which is rapidly deteriorating, is very worrisome. Tensions in these English-speaking regions have caused intense forced displacement in the last months. The situation is one of high instability and insecurity across both regions. Therefore, the European Union and its member states would like to launch the following appeal. We call on all actors concerned to use every effort to reduce the tensions and engage in a, multi, uh, in a meaningful and inclusive dialogue with a view to finding a lasting political solution to the crisis as well as to ensure the protection of civilians. In terms of humanitarian interventions, the environment is increasingly complex. The humanitarian space is very limited with attacks against humanitarian workers. And it is extremely difficult for aid organizations to have access to the populations in need. Therefore, we would like to raise the attention of the international community for the need to provide a stronger regional and international response to the crisis in the Northwest and Southwest regions. In addition to supporting efforts towards a peaceful solution to the crisis, improving access to the affected areas by humanitarian organizations is of paramount importance. We call on all parties to allow and facilitate safe, timely, and unhindered humanitarian access to those in need of humanitarian assistance. Reinforcing humanitarian coordination with proper staff and resources is also essential to calibrate the response to acute needs in a very difficult humanitarian context. The third key element is the mobilization of funds in order to be able to provide an appropriate assistance to the thousands of people in need. The respect of international humanitarian law and implementation of humanitarian operations in line with humanitarian principles is equally indispensable given the complexity of the context. We'd also like to stress that ensuring humanitarian assistance to the affected population requires special attention to the needs of the most vulnerable groups, particularly persons with disabilities, who are often the furthest left behind, especially in situations of forced displacement and restricted humanitarian assistance. The European Union provides humanitarian assistance to populations affected by the emergency in the northwest and southwest of Cameroon since 2018, and will continue to do so. The total amount allocated to humanitarian assistance for Cameroon last year was close to 20 million euros. In conclusion, uh, Madam Chair, let me repeat the EU appreciation for this opportunity to discuss 
the humanitarian situation in Cameroon. Cameroon is an important partner for all of us in a troubled region. The country faces increasing challenges. The EU stands ready to work with the government and step up efforts to find lasting solutions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Under Secretary General Lokok, as we conclude today, I, we've re we have received a few questions, particularly from Belgium and Indonesia, and I wondered if you could take those. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, I've got four, four things perhaps I should um, respond to. And firstly, let me be clear, we do want to scale up our um, humanitarian programming and our response. And as I said earlier, finance, money, is the binding constraint. Notwithstanding the access problems, if we had more money, we could reach more people. The visit of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet, has been referred to by a number of delegations. And the High Commissioner and I discussed her visit last week um, when we were meeting together on a variety of issues. I just want to be clear that I fully endorse and reiterate everything that she has said and, and her assessment when she, she came back from her um, visit. Um, I was asked a question by, uh, in respect of the availability of data um, the shortage of resources itself has an impact on our ability to gather data, as does the inadequacy of access. That's just a fact. We do welcome the decision the government have taken um, to set up um, stronger coordination structures. Um, and I do think if we get those going and we collaborate, that should help with um, the data issue. And... Um, we would like particularly to focus on data on protection <clears throat> and especially we do think it's important to document and gather evidence on and then arrange accountability for um, attacks on hospitals or attacks on schools and those other violations that I referred to earlier. Lastly, I was asked a question on um, how we're collaborating with regional organisations and on that I'd just like to say that we obviously work very closely in my office with the UN Office for Central Africa, there's an interagency task force on Cameroon that meets regularly to bring uh, all the pillars of the UN's activity together, including in the region. We understand, uh, as the humanitarian house, that the only solution to this problem is, as several of you have said, dialogue and um, politics, and we fully support the UN Office for Central Africa's ongoing efforts to make progress on that working with national actors. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much for that. On, on behalf of the co-host, I would like to thank all UN member states and civil society representatives for your participation here today. Our aim today was to importantly demonstrate the international community desire to see Cameroon's most vulnerable populations receive much needed humanitarian aid for its children to have access to schools and for all parties to show respect for international humanitarian law. We call on the international community to continue implementing a co coordinated and robust humanitarian response. And we call on all parties to respect international humanitarian law, allow aid workers to safely access people in need and cease attacks against aid facilities, hospitals, and medical professionals. And finally, we call on all the parties to ensure that all the children of Cameroon, as we've heard here today, are, ably, are able to attend school safely. The meeting is adjourned.